Five minutes or 25? 40. <laughs> that's my understanding. 40. Wherever 40. it goes. 40. 30, 40 minutes. Oh, that's for here. Yeah. Up, we're on. Awesome. Hello, everyone. As you mingle in and get seated to see it down, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off here. My name is Vincent McNeely. I'm a senior technical program manager at VMware. I'm also the global co-lead for our Pride Power of Difference community. I'm a leader of our global internal innovation research and development conference radio and a proud member of MKAI, a global think tank focused on morality and knowledge in artificial intelligence. It's my pleasure to kick off the session on AI awareness and prevention of bias in technology as the panel discusses garbage in, garbage out. To answer the question, what is the role of data and algorithms and technology and its importance on people of color? As algorithms continue to become increasingly ubiquitous in the fabric of life, this topic is one of increasing importance. The opportunity to get the system right, as it underpins so much of our life, could not be more crucial. VMware is actively working alongside others to advocate for inclusion and equity in this space, including using novel approaches when using crowdsourced data to limit bias, inviting specialists in the field, like folks from the Data Science Institute at Columbia University, which promotes data for good to our internal innovation conference radio, and making this a company-wide initiative, something our CTO, Kit Colbert, continues to champion, evangelize, and promote, both internally and externally. Um, within the company. Resolving data and bias in machine learning projects means first determining where it exists. It's only after you know where bias exists that you can take the necessary steps to remedy it. The route we must take involves developing and enforcing rigorous codes of ethics that include human oversight and accountability. We can't allow unsupervised algorithms to govern human life. While these concepts are not new, implementation and enforcement is still in its infancy. For example, although we've used ML for decades, it wasn't until the mid-2021 that the United States Government Accountability Office published its first guidance in the form of a framework for AI accountability. It addresses governance, data, performance, and monitoring, along with key practices for selecting and implementing AI systems. While our companies work to scale their efforts in this space, we all can make a difference by sharing our knowledge and lived experience. I hope, to come, I hope to come away with many new learnings in this space, and I hope you do too. So without further ado, let's get started. Donna? Okay. Oh, thank you. Hello. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for attending our session today. My name is Donna Ennis, and I'm the Director of Diversity Engagement and Program Development for the Georgia Tech Enterprise Innovation Institute. Uh, we call it EI Square, is the oldest university-led economic development organization in the country where we have quite a number of programs and services focused on growing and strengthening communities and businesses. Um, one of the main things that happened recently with us is we were awarded um, a major grant with the Economic Development um, Administration, EDA, to uh, launch a, a statewide Georgia um, artificial intelligence in manufacturing project around the state, which has eight major components and projects to it. So this um, subject area is near and dear to our hearts right now, um, just this, 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 because one of the things that I'm responsible for is community engagement and ensuring that um, we have equitable development and deployment of uh, innovation and talent in this AI and manufacturing space. And I do, for our panel, we want to e emphasize equitable because a lot of people say access, but access is not always equitable access. So um, um, when you walk in a room and you're introduced, you know, you can get into the room, but are you, do you feel welcome? Are you being introduced to people who welcome you? into that room or at that table. So without further ado, I'm going to look at my phone. I'm not texting. And um, <laughs> I told them I was going to bring paper today, but they said I couldn't. I had to use my phone because so. it's got AI on it. But anyway, I'd like to um, introduce our distinguished panel, uh, starting over to the left with Dr. Beverly Wright, who is the head of data science solutions for Birchworks. I have um, Ken Viciana with Vice President of Global Data and Analytics uh, Products with TSIS. And then I have uh, Tonya Morris, 
who is the principal and uh, founder, president, CEO of Simply HR. So I want to start with Beverly. With just if you guys could just give an introduction of yourselves to the audience, and then we'll sure. go from there. Yeah. Hi. I'm Dr. Beverly Wright. Um, I've been in analytics and data science for about 30 years. I've spent about 20 years in the academic world where I've taught undergrads, masters, and doctoral students. And I continue to teach executive education at University of Georgia and serve on the board uh, at Georgia Tech. I've also spent about a dozen years working on client side, uh, either as an individual contributor or team lead of data science at companies like uh, Truist, Cox Communications and Southern Company Georgia Power. And I've spent about a dozen years in the consulting business. So now Birchworks is a company that helps with permanent contract and data science solutions. Um, I also am the chair of the TAG Data Science and Analytics Society, the president of the Analytics Society at Informs. I run a podcast through TAG called TAG Data Talk. And I run a for good initiative that leverages data science for good, also under the TAG umbrella. Thank you. Beverly's really busy, as you can tell. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, tough, tough act no to sleep. follow there. <laughs> uh, Ken Viciana, so I work for TSIS. We're part of Global Payments. We're in the FinTech space. Um, I'm responsible for monetizing our data. So really, data and analytics, data science. I've been in the industry for over 20 years, been in Atlanta for about 15 years. Uh, Beverly and I crossed paths at Truist briefly, but I worked at uh, Equifax and, and Fiserv and now, now over at Tesis. Um, my current team, I have a team of product folks who are um, kind of helping bring new innovation to market. And then I also have a, a data science team uh, working very closely with AI. So, you know, look forward to the discussion. I'm also the board chair for the Tag Data Governance Society. so. Welcome you all. If you'd like to come out to some events, we'll be publishing our calendar uh, pretty soon for next year. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Tanya Morris. I am the owner and founder of Simply HR. You know, when I first started Simply HR, I said I wanted it to be simplistic because I knew AI was coming, right? So how timely has that been? But we are a multi-generational HR consultant firm. And we also specialize in GNI and DNI. Many of you may be saying, well, what is GNI? Generational inclusion. We know we got five generations working side by side. And one of our goals is to be the catalyst for transforming and um, looking at organizations from a data standpoint because we got new and different perspectives. And where all my Gen Zs and my Gen uh, Millennials are they in the house today? We want technology. And so we are the organization to help organizations and leaders understand that. We are here. Awesome. I'm gonna ha I'm gonna share with you since you guys are gonna be doing most of the talking. Okay. So what we thought we would do is um, open up the discussion by giving you a definition or our definitions of artificial intelligence. So we know everybody's probably coming to the table here with their own perception or perspective, I should say, of what it is. So we thought we'd open with the panel, um, giving you some definitions of what artificial intelligence is, and then we'll get into a, a deeper dive discussion about it. Yep, I'll go ahead. Um, oh, that one's not going to work. Okay. Thank you. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so Tom Davenport talks about the definition of AI, and he says it's kind of a squishy construct, sort of like love or intelligence, where you can't define it with just one thing. Um, but in his conversation with the founder at Data, I think it was Data Robot, um, he talked about how does this fit into our technology world today, and what does AI really mean? So there are a lot of words that are kind of related to AI. Words like automation, which can sometimes cause fear in workers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Words like machine learning, which is most, I guess, relevant and near and dear for uh, Ken and I's world, um, that, that assume that there's some sort of auto-correction without human intervention, which yeah. is not really the case right now. Um, but the, it sort of makes that assumption. And then there's RPA, which if you're not familiar with it, is robotic process mm -hmm. um, automation. Yeah which RPA is you know, sort of a type of AI as well. So, but none of them fully define what AI really is. So the best way to think about it is with an example, um, and then I'll give you kind of my version of the summary of it. 
So think about when you, now every time y'all wash your hands, you're going to be thinking about me, okay? <laughs> so think about when you go to wash your hands at a place that has automated sinks. And you stick your hand under the sink and you start, or under the faucet, and you start like kind of rubbing your hands together and there's no water. Mm -hmm. Why is there no water? Your type of hand or the way that you're moving your hand or the color of your hand, maybe the sink was not or the faucet was not fed that data. Yeah. If that data was never fed to the faucet company, like if they didn't feed that into the algorithm, then it's gonna be like, I don't know what that is, it's not a hand, right? And so there's some automatic bias. Mm -hmm. Now the danger of that is you don't get to wash your hands, <laughs> but, which is nasty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what if we're talking about an autonomous vehicle? that doesn't recognize because you're a small person or an autonomous vehicle that doesn't see you because you're a different color or you're a different whatever, you're walking in a different way or you're in a wheelchair. What if it thinks you're a bike or what? I mean, so these are the types of biases that we're talking about. And so in summary, um, I would encapsulate the whole idea of AI where we're trying to emulate a human process. Yeah. And that's what I was gonna say. I'm very simple. Simply HR, remember? <laughs> but I, when I think about AI, AI, I think about it being a model of a human being. Just that plain and simple. How we move, how we think, and that's how I, I look at AI. And the reason why I said that, I was doing a project for a security company, and we were at home. We were doing a, um, some videos about how we look because the bias, like you were talking about, um, Beverly, is, again, is modeling behaviors of individuals so it can do some of the work, if not help us with the work. Yeah, and you know, being in the data and analytics space for a long time, I mean, we've, we've thrown armies at data to analyze it and um, draw insights from it. And, and the way I kind of view AI, it's, it's a tool in our tool belt, right, that's gonna help us um, not need as much manpower, lever leverage the technology, the automation, but there's always gonna be that human component. I, I think that was the fear when it first kinda, kinda came to life. It was like, oh, they're gonna work us out of a job, right? They're not gonna need data and analytics people anymore. But there's, there still is always that interpretation, that human touch. And, and an area that's kind of grown out of this has been the need to have model governance. So, you know, making sure that there's not, you know, bias in, in the models and you're, you're um, regularly kind of uh, auditing models, training them, um, and, and searching for that. So, I mean, that's, um, the good news is we all still have jobs, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, the jobs are just changing. I, th I think that's the, the lesson out of all this. So, I'm gonna let you two share, and we'll two share, yeah. okay. So, so um, how, how does AI, how is it um, connected to diversity and inclusion? So, you use some obvious examples of it not being able to recognize the hand or the color of the skin, or those kinds of things. But what are some other ways? Uh, let's start with you. I think our experiences, that's one of the biggest one in our perspectives. That's why when you think about diversity is, you know, when you hear that word, you all, people think about just race, but what about the uh, culture? What about our, how we think about things? What about our ability, disabilities? So I think that's how it has a role in AI, understanding that. And if we don't understand that, then we're not gonna be successful with this AI, you know, way, way of living, if you will. Musical microphones. <laughs> We don't have enough technology. Ted needs more mics. And this, I think this is picking up the other room or something. I'm not sure what's going on over here. But anyway, and so sometimes we, um, I think erroneously, and, and this, is, this is, I want to talk about this a little bit. Sometimes I think we erroneously um, are biased with our AI because we're not being deliberately mm -hmm. looking for certain things. So when, let me give you an example. Um, there are certain attributes of humans that are correlated strongly with your ethnicity. Right. There are certain preferences, there are certain, I don't know, colors, flavors, whatever, that are, are names that are correlated with certain ethnicities. So if we just let the dice kind of fall where they may, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. 
because if we're looking at things in a certain way and we're trying to emulate the way humans act, which is inherently very flawed, <laughs> and then we just copy it, what we're really doing is exacerbating an already bad situation. So it's, it's got to be better. You know, I can remember also when, um, when Alexa came out, you guys yep. familiar with Alexa, and I was a part of this panel because there's so many different dialects, right? And so I'm the Southern Belle, right? And so I would use my voice to say different things. So I, to your point, we do have to make sure we take different perspectives, different race, different, all of that to really model what we want from as close as human as we possibly can. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's there's a lot going, lot to unpack here. But I, but I think a lot of kind of how I look at it, we we do a lot of, you know, marketing type type offers to people, right? You think of like the Amazon, you know, you log into Amazon and it's kind of recommending things. The recommendation engine, very good example. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, and it's it's based on you know, your, what you've clicked through, what you're looking mm -hmm. at. Now it's always interesting when you share your Amazon with your family and they're clicking on stuff right. and you're like, why? Why are they recommending this? What's going on here? Um, you know, but 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 I think generally, from a marketing standpoint, I mean, consumers are okay with that if the offers are relevant, mm -hmm. right? If if they're hitting you with something that, yeah, I, I could use that the, that pair of shoes or whatever it is. Um, you know, I, I think it's a good tangible example around AI. Yeah, I um, often wonder when I, you know, say something and then it pops up on my phone or the ad pops up on my phone. What and a folks say, oh, don't worry about it. Is that, that, that's AI, right? Yeah. It's listening, right? And so, so we know, we, we, do, do you see biases in, the a, in AI? And well, if there, so, are there biases what? in people? Are there biases in people? I mean, I think we all agree there are, right? Right. So, do you have any um, examples of some? biases you may have seen um, in the AI in, yeah. Well, yeah, I know you're gonna wanna say something about this too, Tanya, but let's think about, um, let's think about the recruiting process, oh, yeah. right? Like I work at a staffing company and we help companies find talent and we help talent find companies, right? We're that matchmaker, we'll, we work both sides of the desk. And so if you think about, um, how many of y'all are hiring managers? You've ever hired anybody? Okay, mm -hmm. like almost everybody here, right, is a hire, and you hired at some point, and you've had to review a resume. And if you think about your unintentional biases when you review a resume, you're probably going to look at the year they graduated school and calculate how old they are. <laughs> you might sit, pay attention to their name mm -hmm. and wonder if they're a citizen. There are just certain things that you're going to look at that you might not realize you're looking at, or you might not realize that you're reacting to. If we take the, now that's just for you, if you take a bunch of people and you evaluate the way they're reviewing resumes and you get a machine to copy it times a billion, think of how much bias is in all that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's so much bias. So we, we ha like I, I know I just said this a second ago, but I'll say it again. We have to do better than what the human does organically. Because mm -hmm. this is a way of just multiplying our activities. And I would say it's almost like garbage in, garbage out. Oh, yeah. When you look at it. Um, I remember in 1998 when Atlanta was booming, you know, for the market and working in HR. And I noticed that this bias address and zip codes. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, unintentionally you could be biased just because you're trying to figure out what area this person works and you assume that is too far or just all these social economic things that come up with it. So if we are modeling that behavior from an AI standpoint, we're gonna get the same bias. So that's why I say, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, garbage in, garbage out. And so we have to be very mindful and that's why it's so important to educate us and make us aware that biases is all around us, and if we're gonna do machine learning and machine, we have to be very intentional about making sure that we don't employ that, because if that's the case, then what are we doing? Right, so, so Ken, what are, you're in FinTech, and, and so what, what kind of biases and things might you see um, in, in AI? In your yeah, AI? I mean, I think, I think Beverly summarized it pretty well. I mean, it's, it's, there's no perfect scenario here. I mean, you know, there's bias and 
humans and, and their decisions. I, I think, um, you know, reviewing models, you know, looking at the logic, looking at rules, you know, uh, reviewing output, like you have to constantly be kind of training models and reviewing them for outliers. Because if something, something goes awry in the model, you know, you could have some pretty big problems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mentioned before, we, more of the modeling we're doing is, you know, specifically to, to financials, right? We do a lot of fraud models and fraud scores and things. But um, even, even in that space, I mean, you, you, it's, a, it's a living thing that needs to be nurtured and monitored. It's not, a, you know, you, you set up AI and you let it run wild, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there's governance and, and it's a living thing that has to be constantly tuned and reviewed. You know, I want to say from an HR standpoint, when we think about this, which you, the question that you ask, we also have to look at who we have in these positions, right? We had an example. If you have a programmer that's programming, uh, Caucasian, black, whatever, and they have a certain way that they program, and then you use that as a model, then our perspectives are not, all the different perspectives are not being considered. So that's why it's so important to have diversity all over. So when we are using and employing um, AI, it can take all of it and not just some of it. I just want to mention that. And so, so to that point, what are, what are some of the steps that companies can take um, to ensure or mitigate as much as possible the biases? Or, you know, you guys are in the field. What are the companies, what are your companies doing that you see out there as well? Beverly? So uh, I'm like excited, I wanna oh, yeah. talk about that. This is super exciting. So one thing to note is um, from my experience, what we're able to do is outpacing what we should do. Mm -hmm. We're yeah. out, our technological advancements are grossly outpacing our ethical standards oh, yeah. for keeping up with what we're producing. Mm -hmm. So we get excited, I mean, just like even my little small world, what happens when we create a new model or we do something cool with data, Ken? We get excited. We don't ask about ethics at that moment. We're excited. We want to jump on it. We want to advance it. We want to run it with it. And we want to ride that dragon. And we're not thinking about what kind of fire is that dragon going to leave behind and how many villages is he going to burn. So yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Like I'm visual, I guess. <laughs> um, so that's one thing to keep in mind for sure is we have, um, we have to have some checks and balances in place. And one thing that I've heard companies say over and over again is that one key word, multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Multidisciplinary. Now, I don't think we've quite figured out who that includes. I mean, if you get a room full of data scientists together and start having ethical conversations, they're gonna be like, you want us to model this or what? I mean, yeah, uh, right. you know, where's the data? Yeah. <laughs> but including, I don't know, sociologists, mm -hmm. the people that study theology, I'm not sure. Like, there's got to be some multidisciplinary teams and collaboration and work. Right. Um, and then let me add one more, if you don't mind. Yeah. There are some schools in the area um, that, well, I don't want to name one in particular, but there's a school that has a center for ethics because I used to serve on their board, and so I know these things. And having a center for ex ethics at the universities, a place for people to go, for companies to mm -hmm. get advice, that's a second big step that could help improve what yeah. we're producing. Because I do think we have a lot of dragons running around free. And I agree with you, you're right. We do have a lot of dragons running around free. I think we're so excited about the innovation piece that we forget that there is some security components that we need to take in consideration, some compliance components. And so I think we are ahead of ourselves uh, in so many different ways. I mean, um, we all talk about going faster, faster, and more efficient, more efficient, but we haven't thought, thought about what the ramification of all that's gonna take. So I think we are still trying to figure that out, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, the, word, the word that I like to use around this is, is balance. I mean, I'm, uh, and, and, you know, my role is to monetize data. So, you know, we, we find something that's like, wow, this could be huge. You have to kind of hit the pause button and say like, is this good for the business? Is this, you know, ethical? Like, you've got to ask all these questions. It's not, you don't just run the revenue, right? You really have to take a step back. And I think within organizations, it's having the right um, stakeholders involved in these discussions. So, 
you know, I often talk to, we have a pr data privacy group, we have security, we have, you know, th there's key stakeholders that are involved as we come up with these ideas and there's a formal process that these ideas have to go through and everyone can kind of weigh in, right? You have to think about what data are we using and, and what's the output, how's, you know, how's this gonna be presented to the user? So there's a lot that goes into all this, but it's, it's having that, that organizational rigor, I would say, around it to understand there's a lot of risk involved. I think, too, um, one thing that um, is being done and can be done is to be more intentional about um, how we put um, communities together around AI. So I would be remiss if, you know, I didn't talk about Georgia AIM, which is, is, is really exciting that, you know, as head of community engagement, I'm going to be responsible for ensuring that we reach all communities, whether it's rural or urban, suburban, women, black, white, military, people without college degrees. I say K to gray. People say K through 12. I say K to gray because we know that a lot of retirees, while we had uh, the baby boomers retiring, many of them are coming back into the marketplace now because they want to work. So I think, what what are your thoughts around the intention of uh, do you see a lot of intentionality in your field in, with regard to um, putting the teams together uh, that build the algorithms and the data and stuff like that? I think for me, and again, I'm all HR, human capital, I see that the workforce has been reimagined. And so what that means is, although we have different vehicles like the ERG groups, and I think those are some of the teams that we can put together for the algorithm. Um, I don't think we have to make it complicated. I think that all voices should be heard, and I think that's a, a vehicle that we can use. And I, I'm seeing now more, um, like I said, we got five generations working side by side. Everybody wants to be heard. Everybody has a purpose. Everybody's on this different um, wheel of you know, progression. And I think that's a great opportunity right there to get those voices heard, those different communities to help. But they have to understand the why behind it, right? What's in it for them, right? And so I think that we're now, we're not there yet, but I think we have an opportunity to get there with those vehicles that we currently have in the workplace. I don't think we're there at all. You don't? I don't. I don't think we're there at all. I mean, from what I'm seeing, um, I think that there are definitely ways that we can get there, but I'm not, unfortunately, I wish I could say like, oh yeah, I feel really, really positive that by 2030, we're gonna have this thing straightened out. I'm very concerned about it. I think it's gonna end up having to come down to policy um, and maybe even legal, you know, kind of things. That's why I wish, I wish that we could start putting a little bit of the top of the brakes and just really start thinking about what we're doing in a more deliberate ethical lens. But I, I just don't see it happening now. The AI, the AI right. But yeah. I do think that, thank you, not all, all unethical, yeah, 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 the AI. Yeah, yeah, the AI. We had it yeah, yeah. Right the AI. Are, are, there are some things, it may not be as robust as we would want it, but right. just think about it. We are using apps to communicate now. That's a form of AI in my mind. Um, I think there are some aspects of AI that is in the organization right now and is being embraced. And I think that when you talk about machine learning, no, we may not be there, but there are some components, I believe, of AI is already in the workplace. Yeah, but I think the difference um, here, this is great, I think the difference is two different perspectives because Beverly and Ken are behind the scenes where they're seeing the algorithms that are being developed. You're a user, so you're on the user end and you're saying, oh wow, this is great, this is wonderful, but they're behind the scenes going, no, it's not because there are things missing, guys, that you probably, that, let, 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 yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think the challenge is that the data, people have different expectations today around data. Yeah. And everyone's attention spans are shorter. They expect things like right now at their fingertips. So like AI has been left to run wild in a lot of areas, yeah. right? And I think that's what Beverly was kind of yeah, alluding to. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I don't think our attention spans are gonna going to change. I, I think we're just going to constantly keep expecting more and more experience and information at our fingertips. So that's the balance there. And I, and I think what Beverly is talking about, I, I definitely see it from the back side of it, but I do see it from an employee standpoint, the workforce that 
We want that. You hear all the time, that's the divide with the generation. We're not using enough technology, right? And so I do think that I will say, are we 100% there? No. But are we able to embrace it? I think now more than ever we are. And that's just my opinion on that. No, and you're right. I mean, I think from the user perspective, yeah. it's different from those who are actually doing the coding and writing the algorithms. I think a lot of the people, which answers the question that we started out with in, in here about, you know, how can we th there be less bias? Yeah, and, and Donna, it, one more thing is um, the, the conference organizers, just by the fact that they made this a session, is advancement. It's, right. This is progress. Yes. This is progress. I think we're making progress yes. just by the awareness. But the, uh, the multidisciplinary nature that's required, the uh, setting unrequired, like not legally required types of policies and having to put pause on things are, you know, we need to have the self-control and the understanding of why that's important. But just the fact that you're here <laughs> and learning about this and the fact that this is a session is already proof of advancement. Right. All right, so we're gonna open it up for questions, but before we do, real quickly, um, real quickly, let's start with, with Tanya. Describe your vision for the future for AI with regards to DEI, diversity and inclusion. You know, I'm gonna come from a, a human resource standpoint because I do believe that the workforce is being reimagined. It is necessary. I think that it should be the foundation of today's workplace because like I always say with the COVID pandemic, the employees you had two years ago are not the same employees. So now I believe that if we can employ um, AI, I think we're gonna have a better experience as employees. We got, again, we got five generations in workplace. You got some, that's all they wanna do is the AI. They don't want the, the human aspect of it. And I just think that Leaders, special HR leaders, are gonna have to put it in their day-to-day -day task from a retention standpoint, from how we attract, how we, um, how we um, develop one another. AI has to be essential, and HR has to be the catalyst for that. Because in order for us to reimagine the workplace, we gotta give employees an experience, and experience includes technology. I'm optimistic about where AI is going. I mean, I think it's it's still early in the in the grand scheme of things. I mean, staffing's been a real challenge for AI. I'll, I'll be honest, and it's really the the most talent I've been getting has been younger folks just out of school because they're they're learning this at, at college. Which I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer. I don't want to age myself, but uh, you know, kind of what I learned in school is and what they're learning in school today, right? So and that's natural. I mean, I, and as it evolves, you know, newer generations, you know, people will will have more knowledge of it, more expertise, and you know, I, I think we will obtain more balance as we go. Um, yeah, you know, it may take something really bad happening, right? Like some some uh, some fiasco for for people, you know, the government to step in and do something, or you know, add some regulations. A lot of times that helps kind of get steam behind these things, unfortunately. Um, but you know, grand scheme of things, I think we'll learn and grow, and you know, we'll we'll recognize the value of it. We're doomed. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I'm kidding. Um, I I I have. I have a dream. <laughs> I have a dream uh, as far as a vision of how AI will look with respect to DEI. I think it's important to recognize that one of the, at least from a human individual standpoint, one of the uh, biggest efforts right now, especially with retail and CPG, is personalization, right? Alexa, tell me blah, blah, blah. Why are you telling me about the zoo, Alexa? You know I'm vegan. I literally talk back to her like that. You know, or like, hey, tell me this. And, and she'll tell me some kind of clothing brand that is, you know, Dolce & Gabbana has got like leather and fur, and I don't wear that because I'm vegan. And so I, I try to tell her, like, don't ever talk to me about anything that's not vegan, Alexa. And she doesn't understand. But eventually I think she will. You know, she will get down to that level. And so the reason I mentioned personalization in response to the question about where is AI and as it relates to DEI, is I think that as we build models that become more focused on personalization, we have to be even more deliberate about the way we manage that process and how we are better 
about our technology than we are in our own natural selves. And secondly, I hope that we can actually learn from our children. And when I say children, I mean our technology babies. I hope that we will start seeing those iterations that are better than we are and that we start to behave more like them. All right, so we're gonna open it up for questions. Before, before I, you, you first, I saw your hand and then your hand. Um, I'm not gonna get into it, but just last night or night before last, I was watching Lisa Ling. Does anybody watch Lisa Ling? Check her out. She has a series, on, uh, an episode on called Science, Technology, and Toys. And um, just check it out. It's, it's about a manufacturer that's manufacturing these toy dolls that all AI. So I think that would be a great thing for you guys to watch one day. So that lady back here, you want to come up to the... Hey everyone, I'm Kaylin Wilson here with Dream Forward Consulting. Uh, I appreciate the mention of a multidisciplinary approach. Um, I'm currently finishing my doctorate in organizational psychology and have worked in the AI space at some companies and that is very much needed. I think my question for you all would be as you engage with different companies in the ecosystem, so small consulting firms like mine, all the way up to big tech like the Metas and Googles of the world, where do you see there could be a better bridge uh, between those stakeholders in the ecosystem to be able to engage with one another better and share information that can make the entire AI experience better for the end users from an ethics standpoint? I mean, I, th I think there's a big opportunity to, to share across companies, capabilities, AI, even, even data. I mean, I, we, we're talking all the time. I mean, what, what data do we have versus, you know, other companies and how can we kind of bring that together and, and kind of benefit? Um, I don't have a lot of ex specific experience with like, a, you know, Meta or, or, or Google specifically, but... I think there is an opportunity to build some bridges there, right, and, and try to leverage each other's capabilities. I don't know. If you have I just want to add. I, I just want to add. I think that we can do more strategic partnership. Like for me, it would be very important for me to partner with someone that's doing the modeling, since I'm on the front end of workforce development. And I think partnership is going to be important. I, I know as a consultant. That's the way we grow, that's how, that's how we impact when we come together. We can't do anything alone. And so I think with AI being the, the future, we have to do that, especially if you're in a consulting world and you're, you're consulting in that realm. Hi, my name's Chris Betts. Um, I uh, have a small staffing organization called Pro High Resources, but I've been in the industry for longer than I'm going to admit on this microphone. Um, mine is more of an awareness to bring up a few things that are more, less of questions. So one of the things you guys brought up were behind the scenes on the AI and, and machine learning, and the other is the user side, which is pretty much most of the people that are in the audience. Um, in 2018, Amazon scrapped their AI program for um, screening resumes because they were biased towards women. And a lot of that was because they, the resumes and it was a learned thing. It was not necessarily just because of the people that were writing the, the algorithms. It was because of how many times people mentioned the word women or women's organizations on the resume. So over the course between 2014 and 2018, there was a lot of that bias that was coming into the pipeline of hiring. <clears throat> Another one was, <clears throat> I think it was June of last year, Reuters and Harvard Business Review also did another one, study where it was biased against black and brown people. And that was because of a lot of reasons. One, where did they go to school, right? What did they put on the university? It wasn't as much zip codes as it, like it used to be. I think, was it Equifax or someone that got in trouble for that a long time ago for approving credit? But um, these two things still are happening. And even though we're in a lot of things, like LinkedIn, when they had a problem with this, their solution was to try to pile on more AI, right? To kind of combat the AI they had already written. So, but <clears throat> I think the big example that we just need to keep reminding ourselves of how many people can go to their inbox on LinkedIn right now and look at how many times you've been approached about a job that has nothing to do with what you do for work? It's keyword search, right? That's what they do. Is they're like, hey, if you have a developer and this and that on it, I mean, all of us are bombarded that way. So um, again, these are things we just need to think about to talk about, 
versus my question and all those things because these are where the areas that are just continuing to, to you know, drive the problems. That's an excellent, ex excellent point. I, um, I think my vision of, of um, AI, particularly as it relates to DEI and employment and, that, and, wor and workforce, would be a way that it would, AI would pick up attributes versus you know, a name or something. For example, this person plays the guitar, studied in Paris, has a degree or not, and it, it cobbles that all together. Do they have that now? I thought you were singing. Uh -huh. You know, they cobble it all together and it doesn't maybe strip out names and strip that out and it, the AI focuses on the attributes versus, you know, I, was, I went to school here and I worked at a certain company for five years. I mean, I know we do have some of that now with key words, keywords and searches, but I was just thinking that that would be a great way to head as well. And I think, are we out of time? Where's my timekeeper? 4.30, are we out? Any more, one more question? Are we good? All right. Well, I actually have a quick question. I was just curious, Beverly, you mentioned one of the feedback loops that exist um, or doesn't exist. And I was curious, you know, as users, it doesn't seem like we have a lot of options today to provide feedback on these models. Um, you know, you go to a website and you see the GDPR pop up for privacy, and whether you enable that or not determines whether your data is used in their machine learning model. But are there any examples in the industry of great feedback loops that exist that companies have implemented on their websites or in their apps to provide feedback on their machine learning models? Definitely. I I can't talk about which companies or anything like that, but um, a lot of companies provide feedback in as a loop to their models so that they can tell how well it's working or how well it's not or did it hit the mark. And then they, um, again, it's not really self-learn, but there is some human intervention, but it's a way of um, constantly improving. And then others, at a minimum, the companies that I've worked for and with, they at least do a model review like quarterly. You know, so even if the, even if the model's not correcting itself, it's reviewed every quarter. Oh, and by the way, your question, um, congrats on your degree. Organizational behavior, very cool. And tag is the answer. That's how you get businesses to come together. Stuff like tag, get involved, get out. Um, secondly is universities. I've been on, I built the analytics center for two different universities, Georgia Tech and um, University of South Carolina. And oftentimes they will have outreach programs or boards that involve companies and that's where a small little consulting company is sitting right next to a giant Coca-Cola. So, you know, tag and universities are the answer. Cool. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Mic drop. <laughs>